Hi and welcome everyone. Got some great deep space photos of the constellation of Hercules. I got Draco once again. Serpents. I got uh, Corona Borealis. Lyra again. So some great stuff. We're looking at the asterism inside the constellation of Hercules. This is what we'll be starting off with. A bit about the constellation of Hercules. It's one of 88 modern constellations. Hercules is the fifth largest constellation and spans an impressive 1,225 square degrees of sky. However, despite its large apparent size, it's rather faint. It's a very big constellation that we have a hard time seeing because it's very dim. Although easily traceable under dark skies, the constellation can become elusive with just a hint of light pollution or when viewed under a moonlit sky. Last night was not a moonlit sky. It was actually just after a storm and I was able to get it just fine. The centerpiece of Hercules is a trapezoid shaped asterism, commonly known as the keystone. The four stars of the keystone are Eta Hercules, Zeta Hercules, Epelson Hercules and Pi Hercules. They are all between magnitudes of 3 and 4 in brightness. The brightest of the four, Zeta Hercules, shines at a magnitude of 2.81. We're talking about a constellation, Hercules, that has many globular clusters and planetary nebulae. Just M13 that's in the center of the trapezoid asterism, the keystone they call it, we're talking 300,000 stars, 15 documented planets inside the constellation of Hercules, and thousands more ready to be found. Hercules is approximately 359 light years away from Earth. So a little bit about deep sky objects, the globular cluster of Hercules, M13 guys. The Great Hercules Globular Cluster, absolutely amazing. And of all of the deep sky objects in Hercules, one of them stands out above all, and that is the spectacular showpiece, Globular Cluster M13. Universally acclaimed, guys, as the finest globular cluster in the Northern Hemisphere, and is early found on the western side of the Keystone Asterism. So, you'll see, I have... I'll have the photo up here. In the asterism to the right, uh, between Eta Hercules and Zeta Hercules, you will see the mark of M13. Um, 300,000 stars. And the location, guys, the distance from here, from the photo that I took, 25,100 light years distance away, with a spatial diameter of about 145 light years. Like all globular clusters, it is extremely old. The estimated age, well, they say what we know, what NASA tells us, I guess, and scientists, 10 billion years old, Messier 13. But now, beside Messier 13, just 10 degrees northeast of Messier 13, to the bottom right, you'll see a little red dot there. That's M92. It often goes unnoticed, guys. This superb object is often shadowed due to its more illustrious neighbor, M13. M92 appears in telescopes as a slightly fainter and smaller version of M13. We can see it here. It looks like a red sun, if you want. Uh, M92 is located at 26,700 light years distance, and it has a spatial diameter of 108 light years. So we're looking at a diameter of 108 light years, but 26,700 light years away. And this is the size that I'm getting it with a 1,000 millimeter lens. Pretty fascinating. These are some really nice close shots. This is the constellation of Lyra. The constellation of Lyra has planets and it has many, many stars which are basically suns. And I'm telling you, they're just absolutely spectacular. I'm able to get them really clear. This is Betelgeuse. Absolutely beautiful, a monster, supposed to explode into a supernova 
in a million years and it will be closer to Earth. Just a spectacular shot of it. I see 4592 or is it 4295? I'm all mixed up now. This is, I think it was the horse head nebula, very far away. But um, you can see the emanating colors that uh, many of these are galaxies. Each speck of light that you can see are hundreds, some hundreds of thousands light years away. Just wanted to share this with you. Constellation Corona Borealis. Small constellation. Well, we're talking constellation. So when we talk about small, it still is a very, very wide constellation. I mean, the stars in it, are, they're binary star systems, and they are twice the size of the sun. These, um, the heat that comes off of these, the Kelvins and the, the high Kelvins, uh, maybe eight, nine thousand, ten thousand Kelvin degrees, coming from these stars in the Corona Borealis. Seven stars that make up the constellation's distinctive crown-shaped pattern are all fourth magnitude stars, except for the brightest of them, Alpha Coronae Borealis. The other six stars, Theta, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epelson, and Iota Coronae Borealis. The German cartographer, Johann Bayer, gave 20 stars in Corona Borealis, Bayer designations from Alpha to Epelson. This was in 1603 to characterize them. Um, Zeta Coronae Borealis was noted to be a double star by later astronomers and its components designated Zeta and Zeta II, um, like uh, classified by Bayer as a single star. So yeah, at the beginning, even um, planet nebulae, they thought these were planets way back, hundreds of years ago, everyone was assuming that these things were planets. Even stars, they were thinking they were seeing one star, when in reality there was one, two, three, and sometimes four and five and six stars all together. It's absolutely amazing. I won't stay too long on the information about it, but uh, Corona Borealis, guys, the, this constellation is home to two remarkable variable stars. Uh, T. Coronae Borealis is a cataclysmic variable stars. You'll see why I'm talking about this. Also known as the Blaze Star. No, normally placed around magnitude 10. It has a minimum of 10.2 and maximum 9.9. .9. It brightens to magnitude 2 in a period of hours. Caused by a nuclear chain reaction and the subsequent explosion T. Coronae Borealis is one of a handful of stars called recurrent novae. This was so interesting to me. What does it mean? Recurrent novae, they're objects that have been seen to experience multiple nova eruptions. Um, there are some 10 known galactic recurrent novae, known entirely through science. The recurrent nova typically brightens by about 8.6 magnitude, whereas a classic nova brightens by more than 12 magnitude. So this little UFO is traveling for us around Corona Borealis to see the stars, just beautiful crown, round shape, probably missing about one planet, one star or two to be able to complete that circle. Just throwing in a shot of Jupiter here, beautiful shot of Jupiter. No, Jupiter looks like um, an egg with yolk. That's what it looks like. That's what many say. And when I saw this planet, I knew right away it was Jupiter. And I laughed because, and this was during the planet alignment of 216. And surrounding the constellations that I'm showing you, well, we have the constellation of Booties. And just quickly, well, Arcturus is what you're seeing here. It's the brightest star in the constellation of Booties, fourth brightest in the night sky and the brightest in the northern celestial hemisphere. Arcturus, guys, is getting closer to the sun, has a proper motion, two arc seconds a year. Um, they say it's greater than any first magnitude star other than A Centauri. It's moving rapidly, 122 kilometers per second relative to the solar system, and it's now almost at its closest point to the sun. Closest approach will happen in about 4,000 years when the star will be a few hundred 
of a light year closer to Earth than it is today. Arcturus is thought to be an old disk star and appears to be moving with a group of 52 other such stars known as the Arcturus Stream. In astronomy, the Arcturus Moving Group or Arcturus Stream is a moving group or stellar stream which includes the nearby bright star Arcturus. It comprises many stars which share similar proper motion and so appear to be physically associated. So these group of stars, where are they from? They're following Arcturus and they're very deficient and, and heavy. Uh, this group of stars is not in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy uh, and has been proposed as a remnant of an ancient dwarf satellite galaxy long since disrupted and assimilated into the Milky Way. It consists of old stars deficient in heavy elements. So that's interesting to know. You often see Arcturus and we see all the stars around it and you wonder, well, what are they? This is just a nice close shot of Betelgeuse um, in X-ray. I always love seeing the outline details and or surrounding space with these beautiful X-ray. Gamma Draconis. We're in the constellation of Draco, where the Eee, reptilians are. Gamma Draconis, also named Eltanen, a star in the northern constellation of Draco. Despite the Gamma designation, it is actually the brightest star in the constellation of Draco. In 1.5 million years, Eltanen will pass within 28 light years of Earth at this point, assuming its current absolute magnitude does not change, that is. It will be the brightest star in the night sky, nearly as bright as Sirius is at the present moment. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Gamma Draconis is an evolved giant star with a stellar classification of K5. Uh, the spectrum of this star has served as one of the stable anchor points by which other stars are classified. It has 72% more mass than the sun and it has expanded to around 48 times the sun's girth. It is radiating about 471 times as much luminosity as the sun from its outer atmosphere at an effective temperature of 3930 kelvins. The constellation of Draco is a circumpolar constellation. What is a circumpolar star? It's a star that, as viewed from a given latitude on Earth, never sets, that is, never disappears, from below the horizon. The constellation of Draco remains always in the same uh, northern latitude area, but turns and spirals around. But the core of it, the center of Tannin, is always in the same place. It's just spiraling around. And this is due to the circumpolar um, area, seeing that it's um, in the celestial poles it's it's due to its proximity to one of the celestial poles this is why it keeps turning in place so bordering draco here we can see beautiful double stars borders of lyra hercules draco in the center where they all sort of communicate i got this these two beautiful binary star system I think it's a binary star system or double star system if you want just absolutely beautiful take a look at this breathtaking photo here's an x-ray shot and you'll have some more views of it as I'll let you take the time to enjoy and take in this beautiful look at the star we're looking at an x-ray view of it the star itself and look at the long light it's emanating throughout for many hundreds of thousands and thousands of miles away from these two stars. You know, when I'm, the community, when we get this telescope, we're trying to get a bigger telescope. Check out the link in the description, by the way, of this video to check out the support I've been getting by the force, which is are the channel contributors helping me obtain my dream. The community's dream to 
travel out there in the constellation with the new telescope and we'll be able to do what we're doing on the moon throughout the entire universe. We'll be looking for deep sky objects, we'll be examining stars, looking at the density and thickness of the stars, which I assure you, many of the stars have surfaces. They're classified as stars, but hidden planets, my friends. There could be life there. There could be uh, buildings and structures um, out there in the universe, and we're going to find them. And of course, last but not least, I got something here. I don't know what most of you are going to think. But I take pictures of the sky, hundreds in the same areas, shutter speeds that I'm, I'm taking 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 shots in, in a matter of 20 seconds, always in the same area and all to try to get a clearer shot of this object that was on the left here on the bottom left that was moving, the white object. But in the center, a massive light flared up, a massive flare up that I did not see with the naked eye and that I got in my photos. Now look at this guys. It's an absolutely very large object with a trail behind it that either hit something or was hit by something or went through something. Look at the force plasmic fire at the back. Beautiful array, an explosion or whatever it may be. This object went through it. Just exceptional. What are the chances of someone getting that? Well, they're pretty high, actually, because if you take many pictures of the sky in the same area, like I mentally do, it's ridiculous what I do. I'll take two, three hundred photos of the same area. Lo and behold, there is always an anomaly, but of course, it's the time and work of doing these photos, processing them, viewing each and every one of them. This video that I made, I took 48 hours. I stayed up for two days to process these photos because I wanted to scoot them out as fast as I could. It's breathtaking for me, but that's just me. Constellation pictures, I've wanted to see them all my life to know what was really out there. And now we're doing it from Earth. Wait till we get the big telescope. We'll go all over the constellations and we'll get that moon. This is the group that I call the force of the community. They're helping me raise the money for the big telescope. They've given me generously so far. We've amassed more than $3,000 in a period of less than three months. Guys, we're going to get this big mama telescope. Check out the link in the description to see how much support we're getting. The community is getting for the support in raising money funds to get this big mama telescope we're looking for a bigger telescope to travel through the constellations to get back on that moon and expose the structures properly